many, many uh, wonderful presentations. I literally feel that I'm going to repeat a lot of what has already been said. This was written before we had all these case studies and the presentations. And one thing I must say, that the write-ups that we got from NGO, the presentations have been orders of magnitude superior to the write-ups that we see. So this is, this is was based on these write-ups and we certainly know we're close to the kind of presentation we have seen before. But uh, from Professor Fonsalker, we got an answer I view. I am taking more of a macro view. So it's more like the two books in development that have come out recently. One is uh, World Economics, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. There, if you read the last chapter, they say that let's not get into political economy, let's not get into the macro. There's enough slack at the micro level, which you can, if you do minor thinking, you can still make lives much better. There's another book, I don't know if you guys have read it. It's by Dera Nizamoglu and uh, John, um, it, Simon Johnson, Johnson Simon. Uh, this is a, a book called Why Nations Fail. They take a diametrically opposite view. They said institutions and macro context is important. And without having the right macro context, without having the right political institutions, it's hard for these small changes to have an impact. Even if the effect will be there, it won't be. Yeah? So it's not quite like these two, uh, these four great economists, but I think mean, like, like them, I also take a bit of a macro perspective and ask some uh, meta questions. So this is the background. Agriculture is still the main source of livelihood for majority of Indians. 80% of landowners own less than, this is ownership, not holding. Holding is different. Less than two hectares of land, 55% own less than a hectare. The operational holding uh, process of passing already mentioned. But if you look at the big picture, it's disappointing for farmers. The farmers per capita consumption uh, is less than other occupational groups from the NSS data, even within rural areas. Situation is worse for small and marginal farms. So the big picture disappoints. But as you've seen throughout the day, there, there's still quite a few examples of positive gradients. The small farmers that we saw were doing much better. So the question that we are grappling with is what is it that they do different or differently? What in strategies, practices, or their own individual skills and qualities? What kind of institutional arrangements and infrastructure help? Uh, and how can we mainstream their success? Uh, that, the last question is probably the most important. So as uh, people have pointed out earlier, the first thing, uh, so I have observations and they are followed by questions. So the first thing that you see is that the land, almost by definition, has become much less important and is replaced by knowledge, skills, and network, access to networks and capital. Mm -hmm. So land is still essential. It's still the locus of where a lot of things will happen. But its contribution to value creation is becoming increasingly less important. Even in cereal cultivation, machines are becoming more important. As reflected at least partly in land rents, if you see in many parts of India, they're not going as fast as value from land, uh, value created from land is increasing. So the small farmers, they leverage land and their access to water to create value, but they use their enterprise, their access to markets, and their own personal market orientation. Now the question that I am going to pose is, as what Dr. Pratapur was pointing out, a lot of farmers in India are very, very, very small, especially in eastern India but and southern India. So is this strategy, is, uh, is this viable for sub-marginal farmers too? Uh, we saw that all the NGOs and other sweat done cases, they could not find really small farmers doing that well. So what would be the future? Would it be that these farmers would aggregate and there would be reverse reasoning and others and these small farmers would go out of business? Or, uh, yeah, that's that's the one question that, that occurred to me. Uh, second is that water control is a prerequisite. That came up through all the examples. But we did, and I want to highlight here that it's not irrigation, it's the water control that is prerequisite. We didn't find a single example of a farmer dependent on a canal irrigation or tank doing well. He had a lift system. Lift is important, that's what I say. It gets you water control. Canal irrigation, I'm not against it. I'm not saying canal but you need to have water control. Uh, surface irrigation doesn't give you that, so we couldn't find any examples. Most of the small farmers take it's also because most of the small farmers take four to six crops, seven, eight crops, uh, three, uh, very short duration crops. So that, for that reason too, it seems water control is essential. But I also want to highlight, what, repeat what Tushar said in the beginning. It's essential, but it's, it's, it's necessary but not sufficient. So the question that comes out is, how do we expand irrigation, access to irrigation, when scarcity is already increasing? Large parts of India, water, we are hitting the limits. Huh? And when only one third of land is irrigated in India from the government data, that's the data we know. So are there any scalable non-water intensive strategies to prosperity? Because only one third is irrigated and we are seeing that without water control you can't get it, then how do you expand it to the rest of India, peninsular India, 
Western India, not Western India? Is there no hope or is there something that we can do about it? Third thing which came out across is seniors cannot lead to a small farmer prosperity. Even in Punjab or West Bengal, we have been seen that they get very high needs. So they have to do high value crops, livestock, poultry, fishing. All these things have high production risk, high prices. There isn't a minimum support price, we don't need it, I'm not, I'm not advocating it. And insurance mechanisms are very poor. Huh? That could be possible reason. That we have to remember one thing when we are trying to generalize out of this case studies or drawing lessons. These are select samples of people who have succeeded. For each success story, there must be a hundred who tried, burned their hands, dropped out. Yeah? So we, the study will be complete only if you, if you also study in a certain, like in the next phase, people who tried and failed. Because these, these barriers that are there, they are creating, it may be unnecessarily difficult for others to, to copy. You have to be exceptional. All these farmers, if you read the case studies in the they are all exceptional people. You know? I mean, Majority cannot be exceptional by definition, right? So, by the way, I, I came across this survey data just as an aside. Where in Bihar, uh, Aditi and her team had done a survey of uh, farmers. They asked the question, do you rate your well as average, worse than other wells in the area, or better than others? And 85% found their wells to be better than average. So, we may have... <laughs> so, the question is, uh, how to mitigate risk? Uh, crop and weather is, is, uh, insurance schemes and contract farming hasn't taken off. Uh, still, like so far, Professor Singh sold just only 4%. So, what are the other mechanisms of risk avoidance or management? And how do we avoid the fate of cotton farmers in Vidarbha and parts of Andhra Pradesh? Cotton farmers in Gujarat are doing quite well, but we have this horrible example of uh, mass suicide, large number of suicides in this area. So, how do we are moving farmers from cereals to these crops which are market -made? How do we do it in a way that it doesn't lead to uh, large scale music? Then, a lot of all the case studies here uh, show that these farmers, these small farmers who are successful, are doing a bunch of things. Huh? So, small farmers grow a number of crops and related activities, not only to spread risk, but also because they are looking for opportunities and profit. The point that Professor Kansadra was saying, there could be a difference. They are diversifying not only to spread risk, but also to maximize profit. But if you look at agglomeration, there is one limitation in our collection of case studies that we have. And we have case studies mostly of individuals. We, we wanted to get the case studies, but I think studying agglomerations or clusters is also important. If you look at the agglomerations, just in personal conversation, in formal conversation, agglomerations, their agglomerations have emerged, they are almost essentially, they show more specialization. One crop or two crops, one or two sets of activity. Question is, is diversification essential for small farmers to become prospects? Because, or, and it is specialized because I am worried about the scaling up. That's that's what I am thinking about. Because if you have too many crops, then the transaction cost, the cost of doing business with them, is, is just explodes. Huh? The multi-dimensionality problem like we do in uh, statistics. So it is specialized and essential for scaling up or creating clusters. Could we create clusters with diverse crops? I do not know. I doubt we can do that. And can new channels, the new channels that, that are coming in, FBI, in retail and other things, could they deal with farmers who grow many, many, many different crops? The point again that our conservator was raised. So, yeah. So, there's another thing. A lot of NGOs, almost every NGO in India that works on agro also works on trade, which is required. But we find that there are many, many, a lot of NGOs have struggled with it, that even if you create a NGO, build up savings. So, access to trade is again required, but does it by itself uh, engendered entrepreneurship. It may help, it may be. So high value crops are capital intensive, access to institutional credit is still poor, high cost of working capital is a major constraint for small farmers. But credit itself is not enough. And if you look at a number of cases, I think a higher value is not even the trigger in many cases. A lot of cases where successful SAGs are there, where successful entrepreneurship is not there. So SAG strategy, and then that led is NGOs to move from SAG to SAG plus. Even they have not scaled up, are not successful at a very broad level. And banks are not so much interested in uh, <coughs> painting a pessimistic picture. So given that situation, what can be done? Like, is, there some, is, is there something we are doing wrong in the way the credit is uh, made available? Or are the constraints elsewhere? I am not sure. The another point is the small farmers, by definition, they face high transaction costs in accessing markets. And this has been pretty very different. <coughs> it is essential if you have cash crops, but a small farmers produce in small quantities, they have low bargaining power, so markets do not respect uh, small farmers as Professor Singh was saying. Uh, 
Sometimes a lot of examples that we have, these farmers are selling directly to consumers. That's a horribly time intensive, risky, costly strategy. You can't expect a scaling up if everyone has to take a Kayla directly to the market. How many people can afford to do that? And they're not benefiting from new channels like uh, big retail, etc. Cooperatives also have the very few commodities where they have worked. Uh, dairy is one, or that too in only some areas. Cooperatives have not worked. So, how do we make it easier for small farmers? Huh? Building institutions, all of us want to promote producer companies, we want to build cooperatives, but 50 years of experience is hardest uh, done than said. Huh? So how do we make uh, price and market discovery? Like, there are some things that can be done with new technologies, ICT, that Professor Vadi Vailwaj are referring to. So how do we make price discovery and market discovery easy, easier for millions of farmers? So cell phone penetration and help. I mean, it is a constant hope which has not been expected to a great extent. Are there other informal ways of aggregation, like Kunde Kaas that Professor Singh was talking about? Are there other informal ways which, which are not extremely difficult and could still be leveraged for small farmers to prosper? Seventh thing is that they, uh, small farmers, if you look at that, they prefer crops with multiple harvests huh? uh, because it short operating cycle, it helps them uh, tide over the working capital prices. It also uh, eases the liquidity situation and it reduces exposure to any single big price drop. So it just spreads risk in time and so questions are, is it essential for them? Or could they do, like, could, <coughs> do they have to develop a test for endosulfan if they're going too far with cotton? Is it essential? Couldn't there be ways that, because I think that there are only so much vegetables and fruits that you can sell. High value crops, yes, uh, our taste for uh, fruits and vegetables and meats and others are increasing. But I think there's some big crops also that have to be brought into the picture <coughs> that millions and millions of farmers have to become prosperous. Because imagine, these, these farmers are small farmers. The selection problem is still there. If every farmer starts growing a high value crops, would the market still be there? Yeah? That's something that we have to do. What happens when you scale up? The same story will not hold up. The dynamic will completely change and we have to think about it. Right? Eighth is that agglomerations help. Huh? Even in these case studies, if you talk to them, when clusters form, market comes closer, inputs are easier to get, and learning by seeing, me learning by seeing my neighbors, that, that gets facilitated. Huh? So it's, it becomes easier when a cluster forms. The feeling that I get is that it becomes easier for small farmers to join the bandwagon of uh, prosperous farming. The question is how do we see new clusters? Yeah? And the problem there is that the history, in, not only in agriculture but in other sectors, is that both governments and private sectors, the success rate is abysmal in seeding new clusters. No one knows, no one has figured out how to form new clusters. Every state capital has a technology park. Huh? Only Bangalore, Hyderabad and Gurgaon have taken off. Each state government has tried to form. So the governments and planners try to seed clusters all the time looking at other success stories and fail 9 out of 10 times. Yeah. But I still think that if we want a scaling up, if you want to, if, to make it easier for a smaller farmers to join this profit bandwagon, then we need to figure out how to form clusters and we need to build that into like when NGOs go out and work into the fields so or when government plan, governments plan their interventional programs. It is important to think uh, about seeding clusters because individual farmers doing their own things and then in a, in a market link economy, I think it could be very, very hard to scale up. So this is something that, this is a big question that we have to do. We look at it more carefully and figure out that how do we at least help uh, you know, uh, the clusters emerge <coughs> the way we design program. Another thing that is interesting is that we talk about need for extension and a bunch of things. But if you look at uh, examples, in some cases, this is one of my favorite I. I'm fond of Urdu poetry, and one of my favorite uh, Urdu couplets is by Farag Bharatpur. He says, Dekh Raftare in Kalar, Farag, Kitni Ahista or Kitni Dekh. Look at the pace of change, Farag, how slow and yet how so fast. So it's a similar kind of, somewhat similar story. Is that if you look at it, some things just take off like wildfire, BT cotton, Guar, no one extended it. Huh? Government was against, they hadn't even licensed BT cotton by the time 9 out of 10 farms were growing. And there are many, many other examples. So sometimes replication happens really fast without anyone deliberately doing it, spontaneously. In other fields, it is very slow, it's frustratingly slow in spite of clear cuts. Each of these five months has a success story and his neighbor is not doing it. Even though his success is established, he is reputed, he is respected, but he is not being replicated immediately. Huh? So why? So the question is, what can we learn from counter examples of a spontaneous spread? We are learning from what other 
what Dr. Kurian did and others did with deliberate strategy of spreading out. But what can we learn from these counter examples where there wasn't a deliberate effort where things spread spontaneously? And what can we learn from success stories that did scale up? I'm still calling them success stories in the limited period. So what, I think we need to study both carefully to learn as to what, what works in scaling up and what doesn't work. And another point that, that boggles me, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question even in academic <coughs> Like how do we farmers, or for that matter anyone, how do we learn? How do we learn by doing? Uh, so Ashok in his case study doing that these farmers do small uh, testings on small plots and experiments. How do learning by doing and learning by seeing? So how does my expression is how how does learning by seeing happen? I think it's a question of academic interest and it's also a question of practical policy interest. Like why do you see the outstanding success stories and it's not that they're doing rockets and they're doing the simple things differently and still <laughs> the neighbors were and it's actually the thing that you can't hide something that you're doing, especially in the field. Yeah, it's out there for everyone to see, and yet you don't see things getting caught. So I think it's very important, both for academics and people who are interested in field, to, to invest more into this understanding, like how do people learn from each other, and when do they learn, or when do they not. There's another question that I want to pose, especially to NGO. There are two different models of success story. One is where NGO goes. A lot of NGOs represented uh, about long-term engagement. Huh? They work closely with a small group for, on a number of areas, holistic approach and long period of time. There's another agency, there's another approach where some agency goes, we have some example of that from Chatham, distributes new seeds to a large number of farmers. And like the biblical story, some seeds hit the fertile soil, a small group emerges, that group grows, and uh, you have a cluster. So questions is under what condition is one model better than another? It's clear, I don't say that every, I don't think that every in every field, that would, that's the strategy that we should take and it would work better. So under what condition? I don't have answers to any of these questions. I think we need to think about it. Under what conditions is one model better than the other? Yeah? And what kind of changes could make these models in each of the conditions that is the more successful? Because there are stories of failure in both models too, right? Huh? So under what conditions would intense engagement be is the only thing would work? Because intense engagement is great. But how do you scale it up? Yeah, yeah. we need to scale. It. The millions and millions of farmers who are poor, a few success stories not getting replicated. I was talking to Wade, he's not here. So he is working in soybean farmers and it has spread to, and he's very happy, and I'm happy to, it has spread to 12,000 farmers. But something spreading to 12,000 farmers in five years of effort. Just imagine how many weights would it take and how many years would it take for it to reach out to everyone. So we have to figure out, or at least at least track, yeah? Uh, to find out how these things just take a life of their own and spread. Then, then, then there's, like, there's a small, if you read the, all these cases, the successful farmers, they are exceptional entrepreneurs. They have similar qualities like entrepreneurs in any other sector. They almost like knowledge workers who depend a lot on land and hard physical family labor. So question is, what kind of qualities can be encouraged by exposure, training, and right incentives? Huh? So, and, the question of Professor Franz Alperberg, if I have all those qualities, is agriculture the, the, the field where my return to those qualities are highest? If I am that hardworking, if I am that smart, if I, I would rather become a trader, you know? If I understand markets so well, then why keep agriculture is a terribly hard business, huh? so, <coughs> so, do men and women with such qualities? And my sense is that if I have all those qualities, if you make the requirements to succeed in agriculture, the threshold is that high, then I would move to other things. So you have to bring that threshold to, to a manageable level where most people like us, who, the average intelligence people, average hard work, people who can have some hope for success. Huh? So you have to, this is, this is that the pattern would be like 1991 reforms. I think 1991 reforms was great for my generation. Now everyone in my family, even those who are not hard working, not smart, they're all doing well. Before 1991, they would have ended up in my dad's generation, they would have ended up being LIC agents or failed business people. Because government job would go only to external people, or to exceptionally smart people, and most other people would have no other option to become something, yeah. After 1991, a lot of you do an MBA, and you, you start making a decent living. Can we do something similar in agriculture so that to be successful, it doesn't require superhuman quality? Because superhuman quality would always be there, yeah. Another thing is that it seems that they are exceptional entrepreneurs, so access to markets seems to have a big role. So my question to NGOs is, it seems that NGOs uh, often ignore markets. And, I, I, and I'm 
they are more production oriented, they tend to be more production oriented. I want to understand from them in this lecture. I know that they are well meaning and they all, many of them are from Irma, they got the same education, like we are going through, they must have thought through this question. What are the constraints that makes them? I can't imagine that it's just because they are carried away by their ideology. They are very, very smart people running some of these NGOs. What are the constraints that makes them think about production first and market later? Why not the other way around? Another thing that this is an observation is that in all the case studies that we have and even outside, the role of government seems very, very limited. Very small number of people have access to credit, insurance and extension is very weak, extension is almost dead. Uh, macro policy environment is not conducive. If you look at it, I am making a broad process statement. This, our government, government of India, seems to be obsessed with food security beyond any reasonable limits. Uh, look at just FCI's stocks of food. And then there is huge subsidies on fertilizer, power and minimum support price. All these policies, I think, arrest the development and emergence of small and prosperous farmers. They perpetuate a low-level equilibrium, even though it has, which has some illusions of security, but no real security. So the question is, can we learn something? I mean, I don't want to just beat up governments. Can we learn something from successful government schemes that scale down? The one example that I have, two examples that I have is one is million dollar scheme in Eastern India, which with just Today, Eastern India, every inch of land has access to irrigation. It is not intensified is a different question. But in Bihar, West Bengal, and Assam plains, a farmer has people and uh, pump. If they are right conditions, he would irrigate. He has access to irrigation. This is a successful scheme in spite of it. Similarly, what Gujarat government is doing for spreading uh, micro irrigation. It still needs to be rigorously studied, but I think it seems like a success story. Okay, what, what are the lessons that we can draw from even these small schemes, not a macro policy scheme? How do we then there is another program like the Swai Health Card program in government of Gujarat. If you go to the website, you have broad level details. You go, you pick your district, taluka, village, you enter your name, the list of farmer name, and your plot number. And that site claims that it will give you plot level detail of how much fertilizer you should be putting for the crops that you want to grow. But if you go and ask the farmer, so enormous investment has been made, technology is being leveraged. People are well-meaning, but you go and ask the farmers, I did field work in North, they are very dynamic farmers, none of them have heard of that website, few of them had got soil and card, the ones who have got it are not using it. Here is government spending a lot of money, using technology, can we tinker with this, pro this big programs where government is putting big money to make them work? Like, from 10% can we go to 20%, 25%, even that would make a huge contribution. So could we do this small tinkerings with these programs that seem to be in the right direction but are not performed? The last thing is, how do we, agribusiness will be there, even if it is exploitative, it will always be there. How do we leverage their interest uh, in a small farmer prospect? The last thing is that all the livelihood programs, either by NGOs or government, they target subsistence. And I don't think that's a bad thing, not prosperity. Most NGO programs aim at increasing incomes marginally, below headcount ratio, to above headcount, uh, head, sorry, the one dollar thing. Watershed development, SHGs, SRI, low cost micro irrigation, we have a long list. You know, they reduce desperation, they secure subsistence, but do not bring prosperity. This is the first step. I'm not saying you can jump straight away. Question is, is it time for NGOs and donors to rethink their livelihood strategies and programs? What should be, and if it is, I'm not saying it should be, this is a question that I'm throwing to the house. What should be the design elements of a livelihood program? that seeks to make a large number of farmers prosperous. And by my prosperity, I think, if I have to define prosperity, not defined by number, but like basic ambitions, the basic aspiration that I can send my kid to a private school, I'm not saying that's the best thing to do, but I can have, enjoy, pay for private health care, have a TV, have a motorbike. Can we, do? the current programs do not even take you to that level, do not even aspire uh, to take to that level. What kind of rethink is needed? Do we need a rethink to move from that to, more decent uh, style of living and how do we, what kind of changes do we need in these programs to move in that direction. That's all. Thank you. Thanks a lot.